Therefore, since we have been justified by His blood, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is the Word of God. Hear it, believe it, live it. You may be seated. Would you like me to put this on, Nick? Well, <laughs> I can hear you. Huh? <laughs> All right, there we go. All right, so we're we're moving now into Romans chapter five, and we're kind of doing a, a different, a new series here. What we're going to look at in Romans chapter five is the eleven mercies from Jesus that cause believers to rejoice in all life circumstances. Okay, and that of course is an answer to our question: Why do believers rejoice in what Jesus has done for them? And I, I was very specific. I chose the word believers. Right? Because, yes, in one sense, Jesus has done all these things for everybody, but it doesn't apply to everybody, does it? Only to those who believe in Christ. And so that's an important distinction that we need to make. That God only saves those who believe. Yes, Christ's death on the cross is sufficient. If the whole world came to belief, God's grace would cover that, but not everybody chooses to believe. And so why... Do believers have reason to rejoice in anything they face? Because I would challenge you that unbelievers don't have a reason to rejoice in everything that life throws at them. And we're talking about reason to rejoice even when things are bad. Even when things are not good. Why can we as believers still rejoice in the midst of those trials and those circumstances? So we're going to look at these 11 mercies or these 11 things that God or Christ has done for us out of His mercy. I could have gone with the word grace, but grace is one of the eleven, so I couldn't really, it just didn't work. They are graces and they are mercies, both are true. Uh, here's a couple pictures I got from our vacation. We stopped in at Old Fort Niagara, which is located right where the Niagara River runs into Lake Ontario. And of course the fort changed hands several times during the course of the French and Indian War, the American Revolution, and I can't remember the War of 1812 if it did or not. Um, it did fire across the river at uh, Fort George on the other side, which was held by the British or the Canadians. But also here at the fort is a monument um, commemorating the Rush Brousseau Treaty. I think it's Brousseau. It's a French name, so if I mispronounce it, my apologies. And this was the treaty that gave birth to the longest unarmed border in the world. Right, because the United States and Canada, right, the longest peace unguarded border in the world, and this was the treaty that gave birth to that. And so there's a commemoration of that treaty, and there's a picture of Richard Rush and uh, the Canadian, uh, who also was uh, who negotiated this peace. As you see, his nose is worn quite well. <laughs> People like to think, I guess that's good luck, I guess. But where I want to drive at today, I want us to. What I want us to think about is we think about this, this idea of peace, right? There's, you had these two nations that for a while had been somewhat at war with each other, right? Maybe not always at war, but back and forth. And they came to peace terms, and it is given to one of the longest standing peace treaties that have been in maybe recorded history, perhaps. But I want to suggest to you that one of Jesus' functions is a peace negotiator. That Jesus is the great peace negotiator. Now here, in the example I had given earlier, we had two parties, right? But very often when you have two parties in conflict with each other, you need a third party, don't you, to come in between the two and negotiate the peace. We see this happening all the time in the Middle East, right? I mean, Clinton was supposed to bring peace to the Middle East, and then I guess... Bush probably was supposed to bring, and yeah, you know, all these third parties that get involved and try to negotiate peace between the two, it just doesn't a lot of times work out, but a lot of times it's this third party. Now what I want to suggest to you as we look at our text today is that you and me, if are not currently, have been at one time involved in a war. Now we still are, but that war is between you and God. And that's one of the first things. God's great war against you. The second thing we look at today is Jesus' 
God, mediator of peace. And the last thing we'll look at today is Jesus, your pathway to grace. Because as we look at the text, it says, therefore, now why is he saying therefore? So he's referring back to the end of chapter 4 where he said, right, we're talking about faith, right? And how we receive redemption. So in verse 23 of, of verse, chapter 4, he says, but the words it was counted to him are not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us, that is righteousness, who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So this is how we have redemption. In fact, he's showing us the way to peace with God. Therefore, since this, since God has made this pathway to him through faith, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have what? We have peace with God. So if we have peace with God, that means what? There was a time when we did not have peace with God. Right? And it's true. Everyone here today really falls into, I'd say, three categories. Either A, you have come to terms and you are at peace with God. B, you feign peace with God. You know what it means to feign peace with God. Look at all the Middle Eastern treaties, right? Israel signs a treaty with Pakistan, and then what do they do? They have their little terrorist groups, and they work to undermine, or we'll sign a treaty with somebody, and then we'll put sanctions on them. Oh, we're not really at war. You know, I'm not saying that sanctions are wrong necessarily, depending on the circumstance. I'm just saying, right, you still have, we're not at war, but we're at hostilities. Or you have one nation, they'll sign a treaty, and then they, like uh, Nazi Germany did back in World War II, right, they had all these treaties, and they just ignored them. They didn't necessarily immediately go to outright war, right? But they secretly and subvertly undermined the treaties and worked sabotagely <laughs> underneath, right? So they were still at war even though they pretended peace, right? In fact, uh, some of the old clippings have Hitler saying, oh, I have no problems with the Danes. They're wonderful people. And then he invades them and conquers them. Oh, I love the Poles. They're wonderful. You know, then he invades them. I would never invade France. And, Right? And he just goes on. Right? Some of us feign peace with God. Right? We say we're at peace with God. We've come to terms with God. But that's not really true. We're actually secretly working to undermine God. And then there are those of us who are, quite frankly, in outright war with God. Now, some of you might think I'm going too far with this, but what does <laughs> Scripture tell us? You have to understand why. Because the first question is, why would God make war on you? See, you know, I said we're at war with God, but it's more than that. It's God is making war against you. Now, why would God make war against you? Why would he do this? Well, if we go back to Romans 1, 18 that we looked at earlier, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So God's wrath, right, and we can see this as Him making war, God's wrath is revealed against who? Or what? Ungodliness. Anything that is against him. And what form does this ungodliness take? Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Think about that. Well, as we were to, if we were to continue to read in out of Romans, we would see all sorts of horrible acts and deeds that fall under this suppression of the truth. But, you know, the suppression of the truth is as simple as what? Denying that God exists. Denying that Jesus died for you. Because that is the truth. And you are suppressing or denying that truth, aren't you? So you may be an uprightly, morally person, but if you're denying the reality of who God is, the creator of the universe, that he's died for you, that you're in rebellion, you, God, is making war on you. God's wrath is coming for you. Because God will not tolerate ungodliness. God is not like our leaders who tolerate all sorts of nonsense and bloodthirsty plunder. God does not put up with those kinds of things. I was talking to people the other day who are rightfully outraged at how especially children in our world today are treated. 
how they're so often abused and taken advantage of and, and the sex trade that goes on in our country, how outrageous it is, and yet that's something we hardly ever hear about in the media or politicians speaking out against those things. We live in a world where we are people are naturally born against God. In fact, we can go back now to, if we think of Genesis, right? Because why would God do this? Well, if we go back to Genesis, the reality of it is we are an ally of Satan. Back in the garden, Adam and Eve chose to side with Satan against God. So why would God make war on us? Because we are the friends of Satan. In fact, Jesus says as much to the Jews, if you remember in John 8, 39-47, right? They're having this long conversation. Hey, we're of Abraham. Jesus is like, well, if you're of Abraham, you would believe that I'm God and came to save you. Or they're like, well, we definitely don't believe that. And he says, you're the father, you're the devil. You're planning to kill me. And Satan was a murderer from the beginning. He wants to kill me too. So we have made ourselves friends of Satan. An ally of the serpent in the garden. The true axis of evil, huh? Satan, us, and his demons. All pit against God. James 4, we'll actually go to James 4 and read James 4. James 4, 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Did you hear that? Anyone who wishes to be a friend of the world does what? Makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealousy over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. So here is James encouraging us what? To switch sides. To switch sides. Now why again would God make war on you? Because God is the rightful king and judge of this world. Satan is not. And neither are you and neither am I. We are neither the king nor the judge of this world. That is Christ. Uh, Psalms 2 certainly bears that out, but we're going to go to Psalm 7. Psalm 7, verse 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, and may you establish the, the righteousness. You who test the minds and the hearts, O oh, righteous God. My shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Did you hear that? God feels indignation every day. And why shouldn't he? Because he sees sinful people doing horrible things to each other every day. Don't you ever get enraged when you see injustice? So doesn't God. Though to say that God's anger is like ours is not entirely fair because we are fallen. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. Did you get If a man does not get does not repent, God will wet his sword. In other words, he wetens it to sharpen it. Right? That's what he's doing. He's going to sharpen his sword to prepare to use against this man who will not repent. He has bent and ready his bow. Right? He's prepared his bow. He's fastened it. A weapon of war. Right? We have two weapons of war that God is preparing to use against the man who will not repent. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shaft. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil, is pregnant with mischief, and gives birth to lies. 
This is the man in whom God is seeking after. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. And that just shows how pathetic our efforts are, aren't they? In fact, we see that going on in our own country right now, don't we? Men digging pits and falling into them. And they literally are falling into their own pits. I'm not going to go into details at this moment. His mischief returns upon his own head, and his own skull, his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praises to the name of the Lord the Most High. This is the song of a repentant man who now has God's righteousness. And he's making the point that those who do not repent will feel the full weight of God's wrath. And God will cause their own efforts, their own efforts against God will be their own undoing. It's an incredible thing. It really is a, 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 an illustration I used a little bit ago, but still is preferable in a different way um, to what I'm talking about to illustrate, is when the Union at Petersburg, they dug under the Confederate lines, piled explosives, lit it, and kablooey! And they called the Battle of the Crater. And the Union Army rushed into the hole and they were slaughtered because they were so stunned by the explosion it took them too long to move. The Confederates moved all their artillery and men around this huge crater so the men charged into a crater and were slaughtered. They literally dug their own tomb. The pit that was meant to consume the Confederates ended up consuming themselves. And that is the reality of all those who wage war against God. Your very efforts to bring God to destruction end up destroying yourself. Just like the Union Army's attempt at Petersburg. And of course, history is full of such examples. So God is making this war upon you. You are not at peace with God. So the question is, what then? If we can't win this war against God, if we are doomed to defeat, if God is coming for us, what then shall we do? And this is where Jesus comes in. Jesus, God's mediator of peace. <coughs> and as we go back here, as we return again to Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we've been talking a lot about faith, right? Faith in Christ. So this word, um, justified, the Greek construction, oh, yeah. And its English translation underscore that justification is a one-time legal declaration with continuing results. So think about this. Alright, we put up the white flag. Alright, and we come together at the bargaining table with God. And God presents his terms. Here's the problem. God's terms require for us perfection. We don't have that. We can't be perfect. We can't pay back the destruction we've caused in the first place in our war against God. Nor can we be perfect in the future. So we do not measure up to God's unconditional terms, right? They call him unconditional grant. Remember, right? Because the floor said, well, we won't surrender on our terms. Grant said unconditional surrender. They said we wouldn't, and then Grant gave conditional surrender. But anyways, that's not how they called him. It was unconditional grant. That was his name, right? You will abide by my standards, is what God says. And the reality of it is, no matter how bad we even want to, we can't. You can't. You can't pay back everything you lost, everything you destroyed. And so then comes Jesus to the bargaining table. And Jesus says what? Well, I will pay everything owed. And not only shall I pay everything owed, this man may have my righteousness. And that is a term that you must agree to. At that point, you can reject the peace offer. Or you can accept the peace offer. That argues only through Christ's Spirit, who enables us to be smart enough to take the peace offer. Because we in our own are very stupid and somehow, very often, think we can somehow either win our battle with God or make up what only Christ can. And that's the thing. God declares you his friend instead of his enemy. 
That's what happens. And that's the beauty of it. And it is by faith in Christ in which God declares you and me righteous and his friends, and we have now switched sides. We haven't committed treason, though the enemy would hark upon such a thing. We have realized that we are upon the wrong side. And therefore, we should be upon the other side. Very different than a man who, who commits treason for gain. In fact, there's all kinds of stories in movies, right? About some soldier going off to fight and then he, you know, gets injured and the people he's conquering, they take care of him and he's like, oh, these people are really good. I was on the wrong side. I was the bad guy, right? And he switches sides. That's more akin to what we have here. We realize that we are not only on the losing side, we are upon the evil side. And so we need to switch sides. And it is Christ who enables us to do this. And this is what I encourage all of you to is this all sinner, give up your war and embrace peace with God. Aren't you tired of fighting for endless perfection that you can't achieve? Aren't you wearied of always having that potential threat of hell? Give up the fight and embrace Christ and peace with God. Though I will remind you of this, you are still at war, not with God. Which is why I'm not suggesting today that when you have peace with God, you feel all wonderful and happy and weird inside and float around in a bubble and be all weird. No. You still live in a state of war, in a very sinful place. But now you have a hope for that type of peace in heaven. For a day when there will be no more war, where there will be no more suffering. You have a hope of heaven. And can you imagine, think about heaven, I mean think about relationships, right? Many of you whether it be a relationship with your spouse or just with friends in general, right? Have good relationships. And you have bad relationships. But even your good relationships. Think about how much better and richer and deeper there would be if you didn't sin and your friend never sinned. Think about that. When you get to heaven, your relationships with people and God will no longer be marred with sin. Think about how rich and deep and beautiful they will be. Think about a world in which you could farm the land and not have to worry about thorns and briars. And rocks weren't your enemy. How about that? <laughs> but think about such a place. Such a place is heaven. Heaven is not just this place, I don't think, where we just sit around in our robes and play hearts on clouds and are bored out of our minds. No, heaven's a place where we have new bodies, where we're still learning and thinking, but without the effects of persons in the sin. And a place where we're at peace with God. Because we know even as believers, it's possible to go back to war with God. Very foolish, but nonetheless it happens. And again, I like MacArthur's notes. He says, the first great result of justification is that the sinner's war with God is ended forever. Amen, amen. Now we see here in verse 2 that there's more to this. Jesus is also our pathway to grace. Through him, that is Jesus, we have also obtained what? Access. How have we obtained this access? By faith. Into the grace in which we stand. What's this grace? Forgiveness of sins. Peace with God. That is grace. Unmerited favor. In which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So just briefly, what does this mean? We have also obtained access by faith. Through who? Through Christ. See, Jesus is the way to God. Jesus is the way to peace. When you go home this morning, are you going to go out and flip a coin? Say, right heads, left tails. How many do you think you're going to be successful in getting home that way? Now, I live just up the road, so I might get lucky. I only have two flips, so I could get lucky. Yeah. 
probably not going to get home, and especially if you were going to go to northeast tonight. If at every intersection you flip a coin to decide which way you're going to go, you think you're going to get there? No. And the same is true to heaven. What makes us think that spiritually we can just flip a coin and end up at heaven? It's silliness. All roads lead to heaven. What kind of clown came up with that idea? It's like saying all roads lead to Bumpville. How, see how that works for you. <laughs> or just, I mean, we've all heard the saying all roads lead to Rome, but that only works if you're walking the right direction. You could be walking away from Rome. You still ain't going to get to Rome. <coughs> Jesus is the way to God. You don't get there any other way. And you might be on the wrong road, but if you're walking the wrong way, you're still not going to get there. you got to be walking towards Christ, not away. And this is the beauty. It's the work of Jesus that allows you to stand in God's grace. And how wonderful it is to have a place to stand in our day. To know that you could stand here and this will be true and no matter what nonsense is perpetrated in the world around you, you're assured heaven. You're assured peace with God. You're assured that you have the truth. And you can rejoice knowing that the glory of God is yours. The world can go amok. Let them have what they wish. <laughs> Let the dogs have their bones. There's another saying goes, let sleeping dogs lie. They probably wouldn't tell the truth anyways. Let the world have their fun, but we get glory. And how much better indeed. Also take access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope with the glory of God. Hope, as I've quoted here, unlike the English word hope, the New Testament word contains no uncertainties. It speaks of something that is certain but not yet realized. The believer's ultimate destiny is to share in the very glory of God. So hope here means it hasn't come, but it will come. Right? My birthday will come whether I want it to or not. I wouldn't really call that a hope that is realized. That's called getting older. But hope, it is something that we put our hope in because it will be realized. It's not an uncertain thing. Well, I hope this happens. That's not how it was understood in the Old Testament. So Jesus is our pathway to grace and our pathway to joy. Right? Because we don't always feel happy when bad things happen, do we? In fact, we live in a world where we're at war with Satan and the flesh and the world. That causes us to be angry. That causes us to be frustrated. That causes us to be sad and to weep and to mourn. But yet through all those things, we can still have joy. You may go hear a comedian and you may laugh your head off, but you may not have experienced joy. You may have experienced a certain amount of joy. You may not laugh at all, but when you hold a newborn baby that is yours or a grandchild, what kind of joy is that? You're not laughing, you may be crying, but you're not laughing. You've experienced joy, something richer than laughter. That's not that laughter is bad, but they're not the same thing. But that's the type of joy we seek. That type of joy, I believe, is a small glimpse or a small taste of eternal joy and what a joy of a Christian should be in Christ and what should cause us to rejoice which is why I think when we have baptism celebrations, they should be better attended and with a better atmosphere. Because how much more joyful could it be to have a repentant sinner come to Christ? If angels in heaven rejoice, it seems like we shouldn't let them outdo us. And won't that be sad to get to heaven and know that angels can party better than you and me? That'd be sad. <laughs> why let them have all the fun? So the take home, remember, God's great war against you will lead to your destruction if you don't find peace with God. Jesus is God's mediator of peace. That's what he came to do. That's what we sing about Christmas. In fact, I'm going to ask Ruth if we can sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I know, Christmas, hey, oh, it's August. Christmas in August, not in July. Missed it. That's what we sing. That's, Christmas songs are almost all about this idea that God came 
to bring peace to mankind. And Jesus is our pathway to grace and to joy and rejoicing. And this is what I'd ask you. Will you finally end your war with God and sign this peace treaty through Jesus, God's peace negotiator? Because it's there. It's offered through Christ. Will you take it or will you leave? Let us pray. Lord, we praise you so much for Jesus, Father God. We thank you that he came to bring us peace, that he came to give a pathway to you, Lord. We just praise you so much for this awesome way of salvation, Father God. We can have peace with you and be on your side, Lord, despite our failures, despite our sin, Lord, that you have mercy and grace and you love us, Lord. And you grant us this love. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, normally I would end there, but I'm going to give you one illustration to tie this up. And it came from a movie we actually watched on vacation. I think it's called The Mask. And the best way to... Oh, is, Beyond oh, the Mask. Oh, Beyond the Mask. Sorry. Beyond the Mask. Not The Mask. Sorry. I forgot you thinking about a different movie. That's not good. <laughs> because you probably haven't seen this. Beyond the Mask. So it's actually like a Christian movie. So the best way to explain it, the superhero is like... Um, he's kind of like an earlier version of Zorro. So you have Zorro in California. And this takes place during the American War for Independence. And it's a lot of not real history. I think made up history. But it's, it's neat with the setting. There's this guy. He works for the uh, British in East India Trading Company. And he is an assassin. And so he's murdered these people and stuff in India. Real bad dude. And then he wants to retire. They don't want him to retire. So then they tried murdering. He doesn't get murdered. He ends up going under, you know, disappearing as a vicar, as a pastor. And of course, he meets this young lady, of course. And that's how that stories always go. Uh, but it's interesting. He's dealing with his need for forgiveness. And she will tell him on it, you know, again and again, hey, you know, and she's like, well, you're a pastor. And you're dealing with this. <laughs> but he, she's like, you know, God gives those freely. But throughout the movie, he continually is trying to work to prove that he's a good man or to work back to pay back what he had done. And it finally comes to a head, and she tells him this. She tells him, listen, God's love and redemption are gifts that he gives freely. And that's where he comes in this movie. He realizes that he must receive those things. That love and redemption are things that God gives. And it's true for us as people, right? Our love we give. Or we ought to. And that's how God has made it. There are things to be earned. Those are things to be given. That's the beauty of marriage, right? Two people freely give it. Not argue outside of marriage, you just have two people requiring you to give them something so that they give you your love. And so I just want to end with that illustration. I was going to end with it before prayer and not throw you off, but I forgot. 